All right, so my name is Dr. Dustin Grooms. I'm a professor of clinical neuroscience and orthopedics here in the Division of Physical Therapy at Ohio University. I want to thank Learn Physio and Mick Hughes and his organization for putting on um, this opportunity for me to present our research. I always jump at any opportunity to present our work to clinicians because I think it's very important that our science reaches those that it can make an impact with. What you're seeing on the slides is our beautiful campus in Southeast Ohio. If you ever find yourself lost in the middle of nowhere, Ohio, and uh, need somewhere to go, don't hesitate to contact me. I always need more brains to scan. So today I'm gonna talk about neuroplasticity after ACL injury and importantly, what you can do as a clinician to try to address that neuroplasticity and ensure your patient's ready for the rigors of sport participation again. I don't have any conflicts of interest related to industry funding, related to anything I'll talk about. A lot of the funding though was provided by the National Institutes of Health and our Departments of Defense, as well as our local university and hospital for a lot of the data I'll talk about. Before I jump into our data about how the brain changes after ACL injury, I like to tell this story when I was an athletic training intern for a professional football team in the NFL of the United States called the Cincinnati Bengals. And so what you're seeing on the screen is Carson Palmer. He was an exceptional athlete, um, very high genetic potential. He won the Heisman Trophy in college. He's considered the best collegiate football player. And he was doing really well, and a... Pittsburgh Steelers player um, purposely tore his ACL, as you can see on the video, and this prevented us from, from doing as well. For the season, this was uh, the beginning of the playoffs, so he tears his ACL, he's taken out of the game, and what's sort of fantastic with this story is that at the time, Carson Palmer was considered to be on the cutting edge of sports medicine rehabilitations. So this is about 2008. He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated as the new standard of care for what return to sport and ACL rehabilitation should look like. And what you're seeing here is him in, engaging with an underwater treadmill. So he could start running and walking much earlier than typical because the water would support his weight and he could have a much faster recovery. And let's not forget he had me as his intern, so I was able to give him ice cold Gatorade and make sure his car was washed and sort of make sure he had no stress. So his recovery was exceptional though he always felt like something was missing, even though all of our functional tests, our strength tests, everything we could measure, said he was doing as well as he was before the injury. He eventually gets traded to the Arizona Cardinals and he non-contact mechanism ruptures his ACL on the same side of his surgical side. So as you can see, he takes a step. No one hits him, he takes a step, plants, and the ACL rupture. So this is your first clue that these injuries aren't just structural biomechanical problems that we typically think of them in orthopedics. We think, ah, oh, if your muscle tissue is strong enough, if your joints are strong enough, you won't get injured. Something else is going on with these injuries and our labs thinks it has to do with the nervous system. When asked Carson after the game what happened, he said the ground came up and hit him. And then if you look at some interesting qualitative data in the literature, when people have these non-contact injury events where they just go to run, cut, change direction, their body goes into a position that overloads the ligament tensile strength and the ligament ruptures. It's a sort of a bizarre mystery. Why would we be created or evolved to allow ourselves to put, us, put our joints into a position that would overload the tensile strength of our own tissue? And so what our lab conjectures is that these are actually sensory prediction errors. And we have some compelling data that the origin of this injury event is not in the biomechanical system. It's not has anything to do with the structure, but it actually could be originating in the sensory cortex and how your cerebellum may compensate for that. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna to talk about how these non-contact injury events are likely nervous system errors. So now the nervous system's involved before the injury even happens. I'll talk about the neural compensations you have after these injuries. And then I wanna give you everything that we've done in our lab or in our clinic to try to address this neuroplasticity after the injury. This ranges from how you merge the clinic, the lab with virtual reality techniques, how you can engage in new motor learning feedback with your patients, and how you might use different sensory, visual, and cognitive perturbations to enhance your therapy, as well as your return to sport testing to try to make sure these injury events don't happen again. So when we first look at these injuries, they look like coordination errors. So our field typically hasn't thought of them as nervous system errors. But there's robust data now showing that these non-contact events where someone goes to plant, change direction, they land from a jump, their knee collapses inward, their foot goes into an excessive external rotation, too much tibial internal rotation, the knee goes into valgus, 
usually in an extended position, and it overloads the ligament. But as you can see in this athlete, it's almost as if her brain or nervous system is expecting her foot to be a few centimeters more medial. It's as if she stepped more lateral than she expected, and that caused the tissue to overload.